Welcome to Medicine Grand Rounds. I'm your host, Lakshmi Santosh, the director of Grand Rounds, filling in while our esteemed chair, Dr. Bob Wachter, is away. Today, we're going to talk about a new epidemic. No, this is not a COVID Grand Rounds, but we're going to talk about what our Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy, called the epidemic of loneliness. And it is estimated, as we're about to hear, as deadly, if not worse, than smoking 15 cigarettes a day. How is that possible? Here to tell us, we are very lucky to have our esteemed guest, Dr. Ashwin Kotwal. We were very lucky to recruit Dr. Kotwal to UCSF after his training at Out East at Harvard at Brigham and Women's Hospital. He came here for the combined UCSF Geriatrics and Palliative Care Fellowship, Integrated Fellowship. And since coming here, he truly has been a rapidly rising star in the field of geriatrics with this a special focus on understanding and enhancing social connections of older adults and how they improve the quality of life. We have a small but mighty audience in the room here, and many of you are watching, yes, alone, on your Zoom screens right now while you eat your lunch. And here to educate us about that is Dr. Coatwall. He has received numerous awards and grants for this work. He is an NIA, National Institute of Aging, K-23 scholar. He has been funded by the UCSF Pepper Center for Older Americans. And he's also the co-associate director of the UCSF Division of Geriatrics, NIH-funded T32 Aging Research Fellowship, and mentors fellows not just in geriatrics, but even in pulmonary and beyond. His clinical work is mostly at the VA, and we are delighted to introduce him today. Thank you so much, Dr. Coatwell. Great. Thank you, Lakshmi, for the really kind introduction. Um, just going to get started over here. So um, I'm incredibly honored to be given this opportunity to speak with you all today. Um, this is uh, uh, so kind of the Department of Medicine as well as uh, my division to uh, give me this opportunity. And as um, discussed, uh, this topic has received a ton of attention recently. Um, so let's jump into it. Loneliness and social isolation among older adults, the role of clinicians. And here are my disclosures. All right, so I'm actually going to start with acknowledgments here. And really, this is a moment of gratitude. Um, I've benefited just tremendously from uh, mentorship and guidance uh, as I've been here at uh, UCSF, um, starting with my primary mentor, Alex Smith, who's just been a terrific role model for me as I um, uh, con continue to pursue this line of research. Um, also, have a quick shout out to my lab, the Social Connections and Aging Lab, that um, just tirelessly pushed this uh, uh, area forward. Dr. Carla Persinotto has been a colleague and a mentor of mine um, who's an incredible force uh, in, in this space and really brought this to the attention of clinicians. So I, I wanted to thank them. When I first started in faculty about five years ago, I remember receiving the advice from Dr. Wachter to try to say yes to most things as they arise with some caution to researchers to try to avoid deviating from your core mission. Um, and I've been fortunate to say yes to just a ton of great opportunities um, with people listed here uh, to collaborate, um, to learn from them, and to really benefit from some of uh, the, the work they've done paving this space. Um, so uh, thank you again for, uh, for this opportunity. Okay, so we have three objectives for today. We're going to work on answering three primary questions. The first is, how are loneliness and social isolation defined, and what are their health effects? Essentially, why should we care as clinicians? The second is, how are these experiences of loneliness and social isolation among older adults affected by serious illness? And here I'll draw on my experience as a palliative care clinician over at the VA. And the third is how can we support older adults experiencing loneliness and isolation? And we'll brainstorm together through a clinical framework um, to address patient needs. Okay, our first objective. Um, and to add a little bit of fun to today's uh, talk today, um, between your empanada bites, if you could join the poll everywhere, um, I'm so lonely group. Uh, admittedly, it sounds a little bit like a sad 90s AOL instant messenger chat room. Um, you can also text I'm so lonely or uh, join through the QR code. We'll be um, answering questions throughout the talk for today. And feel free to join if you're online as well. <laughs> 
Okay, so here's our first question for today. People have already started answering, which is great. Um, what is your favorite song about loneliness? We have uh, four different options. We have Eleanor Rigby by the Beatles, also known as All the Lonely People. Um, we have Lonely by Alvin and the Chipmunks, which was remixed by Akon. We have Dancing with Myself by Billy Idol, All by Myself by Eric Carmen. Hopefully now you all have one of these songs stuck in your head. Um, you can also chime in with a better one, uh, particularly for the Swifties in the audience. And this is a statue of Eleanor Rigby, actually, in the UK, um, just reflecting um, uh, the, the attention it's received over the many, many decades. All right, so I see that Eleanor Rigby is winning out, although actually uh, pretty decent competition. And the people who said, I know a better one, I hope they'll, they'll share it in the chat uh, for later on. So, you know, what I've noticed is whether it's media or music, these attentions get, a, these topics get a ton of attention um, throughout our country, even globally. Um, here's a collection of headlines that were drawn from before the pandemic, where it was described as uh, an epidemic, as deadlier than obesity or, or smoking cigarettes. Um, people really cared about their social connections and how it impacts their health. This topic started receiving more attention in the clinical world due to advocacy from the current U.S. Surgeon General, Vivek Murthy, who wrote a book called Together, where he outlines the health impacts of loneliness, a lack of connection, and how it's deeply intertwined in some of the societal challenges that we're currently facing. I became interested in these topics during my geriatrics and palliative care fellowship here at UCSF. I noticed that as people aged and as people experienced serious illness through the last years of life, um, these could be a fundamental source of suffering and distress. I was learning how to provide really good medical care for people um, as they confronted these challenges, but I struggled with how to meet the social needs that people were experiencing, which sometimes were bigger priorities than controlling some of their medical conditions. And I wondered about how we could bridge this disconnect between the public interest, patient interest in these topics, and what we were traditionally focused on in our clinical priorities. And part of the challenge is, when you start looking into this literature, it's easy to get lost. There's a lot of theory. There's a lot of different terms that are used to describe social connections. Um, and uh, uh, you know, even I found myself getting a little nervous on, uh, on where to begin here. Recent, in recent years, though, loneliness and social isolation have emerged as kind of the central markers of people's social well-being. Loneliness being the subjective assessment that social relationships are lacking, and social isolation being this more objective measure of connections to family, friends, or the community. These are uh, related but distinct concepts that capture um, you know, two big concepts in our social lives, and it's worth noting that they fit within an overall framework of subjective or functional aspects of our social relationships all the way to the objective or structural aspects of our social networks. Um, I won't get too much into that framework today, but suffice to say that these markers have emerged for good reason, um, uh, and we'll get into their health effects shortly. One of the best ways, though, to um, ground ourselves in this literature is to think about clinical cases. So here is one case that's reflective of a patient I saw while in palliative care fellowship. Um, I've, of course, altered names and details to preserve confidentiality for all patients in this discussion. But this is Mr. Smith, Bill Smith. He's an 84-year-old veteran. He has mild cognitive impairment. He has moderate chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And he was recently diagnosed with metastatic colon cancer. He started on full Fox chemotherapy. And we're seeing him in palliative care clinic for the first time after he previously missed an appointment. Some of the things of note, he's alone. He hasn't told anybody about his diagnosis. Fortunately, he reports no chemotherapy-induced symptoms. He has no history of depression and a negative PHQ-2. And he has no advanced directive on file or designated power of attorney. So already, some of our red you know, some red flags may be popping up about his social situation and how this might be impacting his health. Um, and I wonder if we can tell right off the bat, how likely is it that Mr. Smith is lonely? 
we have a few options, very likely, likely, neutral, unlikely, or very unlikely. Okay, so this is slowly populating. So this is a little bit of a trick question, right? It's hard to know whether somebody is lonely or not unless you ask them. Uh, coming back to the definitions here, um, loneliness is the subjective feeling of being alone, um, the distress that results from discrepancies between ideal and perceived social relationships. Um, other ways that people describe it are the lack of companionship, the lack of belongingness, um, feeling left out. Importantly, um, a popular phrase is you can feel lonely in a crowd. Right, so you can be surrounded by others, even be married, and still feel lonely. Um, these experiences um, are, are hard to get at because, you know, again, it's subjective, um, but it's also a heavily stigmatized topic. It can sometimes be hard to bring up, um, and uh, people have a hard time self-identifying as lonely. During the pandemic, however, I've noticed that this has become an increasingly common experience and one that um, is easier to bring up and patients often appreciate. So I have two ways of screening for loneliness in my clinic. The first is, you know, to keep it simple. Um, ask people, how often do you feel lonely? What we found is in, in some of our studies is that one question correlates quite well with thresholds that are used for longer scales that are getting at multiple different dimensions of loneliness. The second way people can ask about this is using the UCLA three-item loneliness scale. That's actually integrated into APEX in our clinical frailty navigator, and it asks three questions. How often do you feel left out? How often do you feel isolated? And how often do you feel like you lack companionship? It's graded on a zero to six point scale with one point or higher representing loneliness. And I'll sometimes use higher thresholds when people feel lonely really frequently, um, you know, signifying they're answering often to at least one of these questions. How common is loneliness? Um, it's quite common uh, in the US. Um, so on the right-hand side, I've listed the prevalence estimates in the United States for older adults, um, those over 60. It um, occurs in about 40% of people uh, score one point or higher on this scale. Um, it's considered a global um, uh, phenomenon where in the UK, for example, about one in 10 individuals say they always feel lonely. It's actually similar to estimates here in the US. Um, and on the left-hand side are um, loneliness across the lifespan. You know, back in uh, early 2000, uh, 2000s and 2010, it was much more common among older adults to feel lonely. In recent years, it's actually become common across the lifespan, um, particularly among young adults young adults and adolescents. So I think um, something to be aware of regardless of um, your clinical practice. And of course the pandemic has put a spotlight on loneliness and a big reason uh, potentially why we're talking about it today. We did some work um, during the pandemic to characterize trajectories of loneliness during the pandemic. We used a cohort of about 700 adults um, with chronic illnesses from the Chicagoland area who we followed from March of 2020 all the way until December of 2021. Um, and I'll draw your attention to this trajectory shown in the green line. So we, we took seven different uh, waves of data, and these individuals were people who reported um, feeling very lonely at each one of the waves that we collected data. Um, so this was about one in six um, older adults that we um, sampled. And this was in contrast to people who adapted to restrictions, shown in the blue, people with occasional loneliness, shown in the red, and those who were really never lonely um, during the pandemic, shown in the orange. Some of the risk factors here were, um, were living below the poverty line, those who were living alone, people who had trouble adapting to restrictions because of lack of technology use, um, and people with pre-existing anxiety or depression. When we've, this is an ongoing cohort, and when we continue to look at it, it's um, shocking how uh, similar the patterns remain. What are some of the health effects? Um, here's one of the most highly cited studies in the medical world, which was published by colleagues here at UCSF, including Dr. Persinoto, Senzer, and Dr. Kavinsky. Um, this drew on a national survey called the Health and Retirement Study, 
um, which included 1,600 adults asked about loneliness using that UCLA loneliness scale I just mentioned. They were followed for six years, um, and there were two primary results. The first is they found that loneliness was really common, affected about 40% of US older adults, and it challenged some of our assumptions about who is lonely. People who were married, um, among people who were married, it was quite common. So about two thirds of individuals reported loneliness. And people who were living alone weren't necessarily lonely. So only about a quarter. When they looked at outcomes, they found striking associations with mortality, 23% versus 14%, um, as well as incident ADL or functional impairment, 25% versus 13%. Since this study, there have been um, hundreds of studies replicating um, this strong association with mortality. Um, uh, as a palliative care clinician, I'm quite interested in quality of life um, and symptoms. And there has been some recent work that has demonstrated uh, the association here. Work by uh, Victoria Powell and colleagues out of University of Michigan found that loneliness is associated with pain, anxiety, depression, fatigue, and actually, actually the cluster of these symptoms, so kind of linking these symptoms together. In some of our recent work, we've looked at how loneliness is associated with high-risk medication use among older adults, and we found that um, people tend to use um, medications for these symptoms when they're lonely, so higher rates of NSAID use, antidepressants, anxiolytics and sedatives, benzodiazepines, and polypharmacy, all of which are known to have adverse effects among older adults. So what do we think is going on here? I think about mechanisms impacting health through, through, through two proposed pathways. One is emotional distress. So by definition, loneliness is emotional distress. When people experience this over long periods of time, the thought is that this leads to chronic overactivation of our stress response system which leads to wear and tear on our body, disruptions in our sleep, and even functional impairment. The second is similar to other mental health conditions. It can change the patterns by which we receive health um, and many of our health behaviors. So let's come back to Mr. Smith, our 84-year-old who has metastatic colon cancer. We decide to um, use the UCLA loneliness scale to assess um, his level of loneliness. And he scores one point on the zero to six point scale. And by asking this actually opens up a conversation and he starts talking about his social situation and he mentions that he's had his cat, Yip Yip, for the last 12 years, who's just been this tremendous source of support and he hasn't felt lonely at all. Okay, so we've assessed loneliness among Mr. Smith. He doesn't seem very lonely. Let's now turn to social isolation. How do we define social isolation? I, it really refers to a complete or near complete lack of contact with society. This is an objective measure where you can quantify the number of relationships. You know, is someone married? Do they live alone? How many children do they have? How often are they actually going out to their community activities? As you can imagine, this can get complicated really quickly as you're tallying up the number of social, um, social relationships that someone has. One screener that I'll use in clinic is looking back over the last year, who are the people you talked with most often about important things? People have a hard time describing anybody. Um, that might be a sign that they're socially isolated. This question gets at the concept of confidants, which um, is uh, one of the most important social relationships uh, as we think about health. Social isolation is very common. It affects nearly one in five older adults. Um, and it has health effects. So here's our next question of the day. Um, the association of social isolation with mortality is of similar or higher magnitude as physical inactivity, obesity, and air pollution. True or false? All right, I'm seeing a lot of trues. We can't actually see the number of responses, but please feel free to Join in here, the information for those just joining. Um, I'm so lonely, pullup.com slash I'm so lonely, or you can also use the QR code. Okay, so everybody is saying true. This was kind of a setup question, admittedly. Um, yeah, so this has received a lot of attention. Here's one of the first studies that linked social isolation to mortality, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, 
Um, they followed 6,500 individuals over seven years. Um, this was a study done in the UK, um, and they found that people had a higher mortality if both socially isolated and lonely. This was recently replicated in a high quality 2020 study. Um, and this comparison to obesity and cigarettes um, emerged from this figure, which was um, created by Dr. Julianne Holt Lundstadt out of BYU. Um, the bar graphs on the top show um, the connection of uh, the relationship of social connection to mortality, which is quite strong. And um, you can see right below that is smoking 15 cigarettes daily. Far below is obesity and air pollution. Um, and so this received a ton of press um, because uh, of the attention that these other um, health indicators typically receive, and also received attention from our, our current U.S. Surgeon General. As data has emerged about social isolation, it's linked to health outcomes across basically every medical specialty you can, you can imagine. Um, here is one study I really um, thought was well done by researchers out of University of Maryland and Yale, which uh, looked at social isolation among uh, adult ICU survivors. Um, they followed about 1,000 older adults hospitalized in the ICU, and um, they rated their social connections based on an established scale. They found that each one-point increase in social isolation was linked to a 7% increase in disability count and a 14% increase in mortality. And if you take a look at that Kaplan-Meier curve on the right-hand side, um, people scoring six on this um, six-point scale, uh, their, their survival is really striking, with a median survival right around 60 days. What's going on here? I think, again, about two mechanisms by which social isolation impacts health. The first is people don't experience the benefits of socializing. I increasingly think of social isolation, these social connections as a health behavior, right? Um, when people are surrounded by others, they, they may be more likely to go out for walks. They may um, have someone to lean on for new depression or anxiety that comes up. Um, and in key times of crisis, uh, they may lack support. Um, if they're hospitalized, for example, they may be the people with no visitors coming um, and advocating for them in the hospital. They may have limited caregiver support for as they're recovering from um, key events. They may lack um, emotional support uh, to, to get through serious illness. Recent studies have found, for example, that um, those who are isolated who undergo stressors like hospitalization are much more likely to end up in a nursing facility long term. So it's important to be aware of these different mechanisms compared to loneliness. Okay, so let's come back to Mr. Smith. Um, we already established that he's probably not very lonely because of his cat. And for social isolation, we take a more in-depth social history. We learn that he lives alone, he's divorced, he has no children, he has no close friends, noting that all of his friends have died. He's unsure how to use a video device or smartphone. He wishes he could give back to other veterans through volunteering, but is struggling finding available opportunities. And when we ask if he can identify a designated power of attorney, he asks if we can be his DPOA. I wonder if this is a case that resonates for many of you all. I certainly see this all the time in my clinic. So to summarize here, he is socially isolated with occasional loneliness. And coming back to our Venn diagram, he's more on the right-hand side of this figure. Okay, so we've done definitions. We've thought through some health effects. Um, next, we're going to turn to unique experiences of loneliness and isolation among people with serious illness. And again, this is drawing on some of my um, clinical experience as a palliative care clinician um, over at the VA. So why should we care? Um, I was really inspired by work done by Karen Steinhauser over at Duke University, who published this paper, Factors Considered Important at the End of Life by Patients, Family, physicians, and other care providers in JAMA in 2000. In this paper, she um, surveys uh, individuals who are approaching the end of life who have a serious illness, as well as their family members, and asks them what's important to them, going through medical domains, social domains, and spiritual domains, as well as others. What was striking about this is people rated their social lives as important, just as important or more important than many of the other medical conditions that we typically prioritize, like pain. People mention you know, having someone who will listen, 
sharing time with close friends, the presence of family, and even being able to help others. People really wanted to give back, even in the last months of life. However, when people are experiencing serious illness, they may be less able to cope with loneliness. They're, you know, they're experiencing many different physical and psychological changes, as well as um, uh, a lot of medical appointments to navigate. And social isolation may become more common and impact quality of life and health care. People's networks start to restrict. Um, and, uh, and as we've seen before, uh, these networks can heavily relate to our care, caregiver support and our ability to navigate complex health systems. So we sought to do some foundational work here, just describing the epidemiology of loneliness and social isolation among older adults uh, approaching the last years of life. Um, so I'll walk you through a little bit of the background for this data. We used the health and retirement study, which was a sample of about 3,600 older adults who answered questions about loneliness and social isolation within four years of death. We then looked at the overall prevalence as well as the prevalence by time prior to death. So on the left-hand side is the overall prevalence. We found that loneliness was incredibly common. So about two-thirds of individuals um, reported any loneliness, so one point or higher on that scale. And about 18%, or one in five, reported frequent loneliness. So they're often experiencing loneliness. When we looked at um, the change over time, and I'll just walk you through this figure on the right-hand side, on the x-axis is the time prior to death, broken up in three-month intervals. And on the y-axis is the prevalence of loneliness. The dots show the observed value, and the line shows the adjusted prevalence estimates. We found that it was fairly flat. About one in five experienced loneliness um, and, uh, regularly uh, through, throughout that last four years. When we looked at social isolation, um, again, on the left-hand side is the overall prevalence. About one in five individuals experience social isolation. And in this study, we defined social isolation as people who are living alone, unmarried, had no nearby children, had less than monthly contact with their social network, and had minimal community engagement with volunteer work, religious services, and community activities. Incredibly isolated. We used intentionally a quite um, strict threshold here. So one in five was a shocking number to us. And we found that this number increased as people approached the end of life from about 18% to 27% in our adjusted estimates. The observed estimates shown in those dots showed um, a little bit over 30%, so about a third of individuals. So these numbers look pretty similar, right? 19% socially isolated, 18% frequent loneliness. Are we just getting at the same thing? So here's our next question. Loneliness and social isolation commonly co-occur. So again, please feel free to join, including for those online. All right, I'm getting a little bit of debate here. Um, some saying true, some saying false. Uh, vast majority, though, it seems, um, going for the true. Great. Yeah, so uh, actually, it's, it's false. Um, loneliness and social isolation um, don't frequently occur. In our study, we found that only 5% were both lonely and socially isolated. When we, uh, a correlation coefficient was 0 0.1, so quite low. Um, really getting at this idea that these are separate social experiences, potentially having different mechanisms of impact on health, but certainly um, different populations of interest here. What might be going on here? Um, there's several losses that may predict loneliness and isolation as people age and experience serious illness, um, changes in people's networks, the death of a spouse, the death or loss of relatives and friends. Some of these relationships can be incredibly hard, if not impossible, to replace. Changes in living arrangements um, and institutionalization. Of course, health can create barriers to socializing, such as deteriorating physical health and impaired mobility. Impairment of vision or hearing can make it hard to participate. And lastly, reduce social activity or reduce opportunities um, for social activity. When we delved into our data further, we found that cognitive impairment was among the strongest predictors of loneliness and social isolation. For social isolation, persons with dementia had prevalence estimates of 26% versus 
and loneliness of 26% versus 16%. We've since been conducting qualitative work um, to understand these experiences more deeply. So I've been fortunate to work with, um, oh, I'll get to that in a second. We um, found that social isolation and um, cognitive impairment are kind of a unique combination which can lead to different um, patterns in healthcare use at the end of life. So using the same data set, we linked um, it to Medicare claims data and looked at hospice use, emergency department visits, hospital stays, and ICU stays. Um, and this is a lot to go through on the figure on the right, um, but people who are isolated and cognitively impaired tended to have lower healthcare use across the board, lower use of hospice, lower ED visits, lower hospitalizations, and lower ICU stays. Now you might think, huh, doesn't that sound like a good thing? That sounds like less burdensome care at the end of life for people who are cognitively impaired, maybe people who don't want health care. I think there are a couple of reasons to be concerned here. Um, and some of this is drawn from work done by Elena Porticolone, who is a sociologist here at UCSF, who does work with cognitively impaired older adults who are living alone. In one of her recent papers, she found two key aspects of people getting left behind and falling through the cracks of our system. The first is that there's a preference often among older adults with cognitive impairment to avoid health care and social activities. Um, they can experience shame or self-stigma as they're noticing the changes in their cognition, and they can often resort to concealing impairment from others. Um, and this can um, lead to a lack of insight into serious illness um, and uncontrolled symptoms that are arising. The second is there's a lack of tailored services, right? We have a complex, fragmented healthcare system, which is not easily navigated by people living alone with cognitive impairment. So there can be a difficulty accessing services that are time sensitive and needed. She provides the example of someone, su someone's sudden loss of a driver's license, which is just devastating to someone with cognitive impairment who is having trouble accessing public transportation. That person was quickly relegated to their home and had a hard time accessing services. Um, it's not just people who are living alone with cognitive impairment. Uh, dementia, I found in my clinical practice, can um, greatly impact the social lives of not just the patient, but um, people surrounding family and caregivers. I've been fortunate to work with Dr. Krista Harrison, who has um, done a tremendous qualitative work with um, patients at the Memory and Aging Center here at UCSF. Um, she was trying to understand overall palliative care needs among um, these families. Uh, and social needs emerged as one of the highest priorities or highest need areas. Here are some of the quotes from patients and families about social isolation and lonely, loneliness. The first was that people with dementia experience stigma um, and tried to actively avoid social activities. One quote, my wife notices that I, my memory is not as good as it used to be or should be. Psychological is a big downer to know that I have Alzheimer's. It's embarrassing. I think of people that have Alzheimer's as just slobbering, babbling idiots. And social, the same thing. Why would I want to go out and look like a slobbering, babbling idiot? And this extended to external social networks who began to actively avoid people with dementia and their family members. Here's a quote from one of the daughters of a patient at the MAC who said, my dad, especially when my mom was gone, was very scared and emotional and labile and easy to trigger. And so a couple of friends came by and got sort of scared off and started to get the feeling like, I'm just, I'm not helping by being here, so I just won't come. So very quickly, people didn't come, so he was pretty lonely, except for the caregiver and me and my family. Yeah, I mean, very few visitors, like very few. Dementia is particularly disruptive to intimate relationships, um, such as the spouse and partners, uh, and so we've been increasingly exploring that link. Um, here's one quote from a spouse um, about her partner's dementia. She said, the emotional stress is very debilitating because as I have always said, you're taking care of someone who's the love of your life. So you're losing that core relationship by becoming a caregiver. But you try to cling to it and they can't respond to it. And it's just this back and forth struggle to make sense of this relationship that now you're basically a nurse for. Uh, 
And this can continue along the dementia trajectory, um, including up until the point where a person can no longer safely be at home. Here's one person who described the transition to an assisted living facility um, for their husband. Um, she said, it was harder for me than it was for spouse. Spouse adjusted to Coventry Place over the course of a few months. And, but my husband leaving home was a sad, one of the saddest, if not the saddest day of my life. And then coping with that, with him still being alive but not being able to be at home, it was very lonely. It was much more difficult for me being lonely. And I was exhausted from caring for spouse at home. We've extended some of this work um, to look at a national sample of married couples to understand experiences of loneliness and depression. Um, this is work that was recently published and conducted by um, Dr. Christy Sue, who's a chief medical resident here at UCSF. It's just done incredible work. She found that spouses of persons with dementia have much higher rates of loneliness, depression, as well as both of these experiences, although they can often be se separate experiences. Okay. All right. Well, that was a lot to take in. Um, Hopefully I've convinced you about the unique experiences of people with serious illness, although we're still doing a lot of work to understand um, different serious illnesses and how these social, their social lives are uniquely impacted. But let's turn now to think about how we can support older adults experiencing loneliness and social isolation, and we'll brainstorm together through a framework for interventions. And let's turn back to our clinical cases. So I'm going to present three clinical cases here briefly to illustrate the diversity of social lives and how we might apply this framework in each situation. All right, the first is Margaret. She's a 94-year-old. She's a Navy veteran who I saw during my palliative care fellowship through an in-home visit for, um, uh, for hot, she was on hospice at the time. And we were consulted for an end-of-life options act, um, uh, whether, whether she would be eligible for the end-of-life options act. She was wheelchair bound, had severe macular degeneration, was otherwise fairly healthy, um, and we were curious actually why, how she qualified for hospice. She was surrounded by family and friends who constantly visited her, but she was told that she couldn't volunteer and she felt like her life lost meaning. The second is Bill, uh, our Mr. Smith, who, who we've been following throughout our discussion today. 84-year-old with metastatic colon cancer. Um, he uh, struggled making appointments. He struggled managing um, uh, some of the challenges of d his disease, and notably was living alone, was quite isolated. But he had his cat, Yip Yip, who was just a tremendous companion for him for 12 years. And then third is John. He's an 89-year-old who I saw in geriatrics clinic. He um, was quite socially active in his community, going to his coffee shop nearby regularly, but he had a fall and broke his hip. Um, and since then, he had a rough hospital course with few visitors. He had few visitors as rehab and now is at home, struggling to leave his home and feeling quite lonely. So all of these situations have social lives that are greatly impacting their health. Margaret is surrounded by family and friends, um, but when she was told she couldn't volunteer, she experienced profound existential distress and depression and a lack of belongingness in her community, so she was quite lonely. Bill, on the other hand, um, incredibly isolated, has no DPOA, um, but didn't feel lonely uh, because of his cat, Yip Yip. Now, that didn't prevent him from missing appointments, not having a, med you know, a medical power of attorney, and we were increasingly concerned about you know, his illness as it progressed and who would help advocate for him. And then there's John, who's in the middle here, who had a hip fracture, who's experiencing both loneliness because of the disruption of his social life, as well as um, objective isolation from being relegated to his home. How do, we how do we integrate this into medical management? So I think it's helpful to turn to a geriatrics classic here, falls. Right? Before I did geriatrics fellowship, if an older adult presented to the hospital with a fall, I would do a cardiac workup, I'd do a neurologic rule out. If things look good, I would send them home, right, with a physical therapy consult and home nursing. It's a mechanical fall. Right, this is where you're all su supposed to start booing me, you know, get off the stage. We all know that this is an inadequate approach to falls. In reality, 
falls or geriatric syndrome with many different contributors to um, someone's risk of falling. And it requires an individualized approach. This individualized approach is grounded in interventions and often can be um, integrated into a multi-component intervention. I'm increasingly thinking about social support in the same way. We often oversimplify the clinical situation as saying someone has poor social support. And we defer to our interdisciplinary team and colleagues, physical therapy and social work, to kind of figure it out. But I think there is a lot more we can do here. We can delve in a little bit further about what is actually going on and take an individualized approach, because I think there's a lot of expertise we can bring to the table along with our whole um, interdisciplinary team. Particularly as we emerge from the pandemic, there are just tons of interventions that are out there that can make a difference, uh, even though the evidence is still catching up. Um, this is a huge area of conversation right now. The Surgeon General recently released a report in May of 2023 detailing the epidemic of loneliness and isolation. He called for cross-sector collaboration to address the societal challenge, and I've shown some of the pillars that he's asking um, uh, that we kind of focus on. The third pillar of his approach is mobilizing the healthcare sector. So I'm gonna go through a clinical framework that we can think about as we see our own patients. My goal here is not to say that we as clinicians should be fixing this problem on our own, but I do think we need to have a seat at the table as we figure out how to tackle this complex challenge. So my clinical approach includes four steps. And again, just to set expectations here, I think if people did even one of these steps, we would be far ahead of where we currently are. So the first step is identifying loneliness and social isolation. As we've seen with some of the clinical cases, we can't assume who is lonely or not. Um, and it takes some work to figure out um, whether someone is isolated. There are standardized scales that are actually integrated into APEX that you can pull up. It can also sometimes be hard or time consuming to ask about these topics. So I've increasingly worked these into my clinical conversations. You know, I've noticed that many people have felt lonely during the pan pandemic. Is that something you've experienced? How often have you felt lonely? For social isolation, who can you talk to about important matters like your health? Do you need help connecting with others? So I you know, challenge you all, take a screenshot of this if, if it would be helpful, but try to ask for maybe the next month. Ask about loneliness, ask about social isolation, make some of these words your own. See how it goes for you. Because what I found clinically is this is something I used to never ask about. I found it to be you know, hard to bring up. But when I started incorporating it into my clinical assessments, patients really, um, it, it was quite meaningful to patients. And that often changed the entire trajectory of my clinical visit because we started prioritizing their social needs as we were doing clinical management. The second step is to discuss potential causes and help process emotion. These are deeply emotional experiences. People may have recently lost a spouse. They may have moved into a new um, home after living in their own home for 40 or 50 years. Um, simply providing space to discuss this can often in and of itself be therapeutic. When we do studies and we ask people whether they're lonely, our study participants will tell us how much they appreciate being able to talk about loneliness. I will use the NURSE framework, um, which is developed by Vital Talk to help process emotion. It stands for name, understand, respect, support, and explore. Um, welcome you all to look that up. Um, but this can be a really helpful starting point. Um, I'll also ask for an invitation for whether patients want help in addressing this need. These can be deeply personal experiences. Not everybody wants their clinical team involved in addressing loneliness or social isolation, but when they do, I usually set expectations that, hey, there may not be a clear solution right off the bat. This might require trial and error, but I care about this and we'll figure this out together. The third step is taking an individualized approach to clinical interventions, and I break this up into two buckets. The first is addressing clinical factors that may be modifiable. Vision and hearing impairment, functional needs, pain, incontinence are some of the strongest clinical risk factors for loneliness and isolation. Sometimes when I'm addressing pain in my palliative care clinic, I'll say, you know, I know it's really important for you to see your children, your family members. Let's strike the right balance between your pain medications and being able to meaningfully socially interact with them because I know that's important to you. For social interventions, there's a lot that's out there that 
um, center around enhancing people's social connections, um, addressing maladaptive social cognition, um, increasing social support. And I found that there's a lot of expertise that's actually out there in our interdisciplinary teams and our communities. And I'm wondering actually if we can brainstorm together if there's any interventions you've used to address loneliness or social isolation. And I'm thinking about clinical settings, um, you know, people being in the hospital, if you've seen this in, um, in the community, feel free to type in a text response here um, as, uh, as we're thinking through this together. All right, I have one response so far, a book club. That's great. Um, I've noticed that anything that happens in groups can be helpful in addressing um, social isolation and loneliness, whether it's you know, exercise groups, um, dinner clubs. Uh, one of my colleagues over at, at MGH in Boston has recently started doing dinner clubs in her, in her community where she invites strangers just to have dinner. Um, okay, vaccines to help safe socializing, that's great. Uh, disease support groups, yeah, support groups, having that shared experience where people don't have to explain their disease can be incredibly helpful. Um, letting pets come visit in the ICU, that's amazing. Yeah, um, I, it's amazing to see how people's eyes light up when um, you know a dog comes to visit them. Volunteering, um, park prescription prescriptions for public parks, um, great. And feel free to upvote certain ones. We can actually come back this later on. Come back to this later on. So feel free to continue to contribute. Um, some of the interventions we've been really focused on here in San Francisco include peer interventions. Um, we've been partnering with the Curry Senior Center over at the Tenderloin neighborhood um, to evaluate their peer program. It matches older adults with people of shared backgrounds, uh, similar age. Um, these are individuals who have complex medical and social histories, often homelessness, um, uh, time in the behavioral health system, um, people who don't speak English as a first language. Um, when we did a pilot study over two years, we found reduced levels of loneliness, depression, and barriers to socializing. Here's one quote from, uh, from a participant that I'll let you read. Um, there are a number of other programs as well in the San Francisco. Telephone support um, is uh, available through the Institute on Aging Friendship Line. It's a free service uh, actually here, but also nationally. The VA Compassionate Contact Corps connects veterans with, um, uh, with to call uh, veterans who may be lonely. Um, AARP Connect to Effect and the Area Agencies on Aging also have repositories of social interventions available in local communities. The evidence is starting to catch up with these interventions. Here's a randomized control trial, for example, of telephone calls on loneliness. Um, but uh, it's encouraging to see the, the evidence um, uh, growing. How about for serious illness? I will often try to prioritize and preserve existing social connections. It's much easier to preserve connections than to try to build new ones. Um, but when you need to build new social connections, they are available. People mentioned support groups, pets, peer programs. Technology-based solutions, I'm wary of technology-based solutions when they are a substitute for human interaction. So things like social robots, robotic cats and dogs, um, AI technologies, these are huge. You know, I get approached by tech companies almost weekly for these new devices that people are trying to pilot. Um, in general, when technology can facilitate human interaction, I'm more of a fan, but this is an ongoing debate. Our interdisciplinary teams have a tremendous amount of expertise here. Chaplaincy can do dignity therapy. There's art therapy. Psychology can do meaning-making therapy. All of these have a lot of evidence in palliative care um, and are growing evidence across clinical specialties. Um, we can often brainstorm out-of-the-box solutions here. And then we need to consider unique needs for each serious illness and how to include partners and families. A quick word on in-person versus virtual interactions. This has been a huge debate during the pandemic. Um, I actually remember Dr. Wachter had a Twitter thread that was like 30 points on whether to go to uh, an in-person dinner party that was you know, a combination of being in home and outside. And it was, it was really helpful, but it, it, I think, reflected how much we're trying to strike this balance between safety and our need for human connection. There isn't that much data in this space, honestly, 
we've done a little bit of work comparing in-person to virtual interactions in the national sample of older adults. I'll just draw your attention to the bottom right-hand corner where decreased in-person friend contact was associated with really high levels of loneliness among older adults. This was not offset with virtual interactions. And I, th I think a lot of this comes to us acknowledging that there are trade-offs to health when we're thinking about physical safety versus the need for human connection, particularly when we're thinking about the long term. Clinically, I've seen a tremendous amount of distress from visitor restrictions in the short term from hospitalizations, but especially in the long term in assisted living facilities and nursing homes. I still um, see clinically nursing homes that have extreme visitor restrictions even now. Um, and I've seen the downstream consequences. People becoming more bed bound, more psychotropic medications use, uh, decreased quality of life, and a profound amount of sadness and distress. So we need to start having this conversation about how we can balance these trade-offs. Um, part of that conversation should be about the benefits of physical touch and cognitive stimulation. Fourth, we should address related medical needs. People who are isolated may not have advanced care planning or DPOAs. People who are lonely may have co-occurring psychosocial needs like depression and anxiety. Um, this can also be a window into other social determinants of health. And lastly, these are complex topics that require a lot of time to address. Our current medical system does not reimburse or compensate for the amount of expertise that goes into this from an interdisciplinary team. So we need to advocate for policy changes that incentivize addressing social determinants of health. There are people here at UCSF that are doing incredible work in this space. Dr. Laura Gottlieb, for example, leads the SIREN Network, which has been leading the Gravity Project, trying to create ICD codes for social determinants, including loneliness and isolation. I'm really um, excited to see where that work goes. Okay, so coming back to our clinical cases, for Margaret, who couldn't volunteer, we com connected her with community service that she could do. She actually started working with the Institute on Aging Friendship Line, where she started calling other lonely adults. Um, for John, who had a hip fracture, we focused a lot on physical therapy and pain to get him outside of the house, but started providing transportation to an adult day health center so he could connect with others. And for Bill, who had his cat Yip Yip, a case manager was key here, right? He needed transportation to his appointments so he wouldn't miss them, wouldn't forget about them. We worked really hard on early advanced care planning so we could identify a long lost relative to help him as his illness was progressing. And we referred him early to hospice so that we could get support services set up um, so he was able to die um, with dignity at home. So here are the key takeaways for today. Loneliness and social isolation are key measures of social well-being. They're linked to health outcomes, quality of life, and healthcare use, particularly among persons with serious illness. And enhancing social connections represents an important opportunity and likely an under-recognized opportunity to improve the health and well-being of our patients. Thank you. Thank you so much for this fantastic talk. A couple of great questions from our listeners who I should clarify now that I've learned from your talk are not lonely because that is a subjective sensation. So one listener asks, are there differences in racial and ethnic groups or in loneliness and social isolation in different parts of the U.S.? Yeah, that's a great question. When we've looked at um, uh, differences or inequities across different racial and ethnic groups, we've we haven't found any, um, per particularly for black or African-American older adults or non-white Hispanic or Latinx older adults. Um, there's many different reasons that might contribute to this. I'll just say, though, that um, prevalence is one aspect of inequities. Impact is another aspect of health inequities that's really important, right? So if people are experiencing accumulating social stressors throughout their lifetime, if you add on loneliness or social isolation, that may cause more of an impact on their health compared to others. And so we need to be aware of that and, and, and try to address that. Also thinking about cultural needs um, that are related to loneliness. Um, the, related to uh, other parts of the United States, um, this is an open topic. I haven't seen like geographic distribution, but I have seen um, 
some evidence that people who live in rural versus urban communities have different experiences of loneliness and isolation. Um, people in, who, in rural communities, for example, may experience um, geographic isolation, a lack of access to good public transportation, a lack of good broadband or Wi-Fi. All of these can, can make it harder to connect with others. Another great question is, how do you kind of distinguish between what is in the range of normal? You know, are we, uh, one listener asks, are we kind of pathologizing this? How do you kind of tell the difference between normal versus slightly worse than normal, especially in these pandemic times? You outlined some scales, but are there other um, ways you would address this? It's a great question. Yeah, my goal is not to over pathologize loneliness, right? This is in many ways a common human experience. Probably most of us at some point felt lonely during the pandemic, um, at some point have felt lonely during our lifetime. Um, and uh, some uh, particularly evolutionary psychologists, they liken this to our thirst reflex, right? If we're fe feeling lonely, this pushes us to connect with others, to address that inadequacy in our social relationships. The problem that arises is when people are unable to cope with loneliness. Um, that's something I've seen quite a bit for people with serious illness. They're kind of trapped in these social situations that are profoundly distressing. Um, when people experience loneliness over long periods of time, I think that's when we start to see the health impacts um, start to manifest, right? The disruptions of sleep, um, the, that wear and tear, the disruptions in our health behaviors. So I think we need to be aware of that. Again, asking for an invitation as to whether this is something that people want to address, want their clinical teams involved in, that's one way of, I think, seeing whether it's um, an, important, uh, an important enough issue to spend time on. Yes, question from the audience. Is there any data looking at other cultures or other countries where it's more common to have multi-generational households and in the prevalence of social isolation or loneliness? Yes, there is. Um, it's a great question. Multi-generational households are um, protective uh, against loneliness. Um, by definition, they're protective against social isolation, right, because you're having a lot of people in your household that's helping to support you. Um, and it's part of the reason why changes in living situations can become um, a big risk factor for loneliness or isolation in later ages. So uh, even here in San Francisco, there's a lot of multi-generational households. Um, and when people are no longer safe or kind of overwhelming um, the caregiver capacity of households and they have to move out, that can be a profound, uh, have profound impacts on loneliness and isolation. So I think we need to be aware of those transitions, but, but great question. I, I think um, that can be protective and we should be aware of some of those cultural, um, cultural factors. Last question, which is slightly related. Mm -hmm. You know, you talked about how tech shouldn't replace kind of the in-person approaches. It should be complementary. What are data about social isolation and social media? There's a lot of attention to that in teens, but what about older adults? Yeah, great question. For older adults, um, less data um, compared to teens or adolescents. I think, you know, it's a double-edged sword here. I think for some people, it... Um, it can be a source of distress when they feel left out of other, uh, of a lot of social interactions that they perceive others um, having. Uh, and you know what we want to avoid is people staying at home, getting on the internet, and just kind of surfing social media regularly. 